Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Rogers. We are so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. First Baptist Rogers is a place where you are always welcome and always wanted because God is bigger than your past. It's a place you can call home. We would love to connect with you and help you find your place in the FBC Rogers family. And the easiest way to do that is to fill out an online connection card on our website at fbcrogers.org connection. Plus, know that you are always invited to visit one of our campus locations in person or also find our times and location information on our website at fbcrogers.org. Thanks again for being a part of our service today. Now let's get started with worship. Oh, it's good to see you this morning. Welcome to First Baptist Rogers. Would you stand to your feet, please? Whether you're online or in the room, I pray that your desire is to draw close to the Lord today. Would you pray this to Him together? I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above and singing as one. All together. Alleluia and holy, holy and God. Great I am, and who is worthy? There's none beside me. He's God Almighty, the great I am. He is the great I am. I want to be near and near to your heart and loving the world. dry bones living again and singing as one and hallelujah and holy holy and God almighty the great I am and who is worthy there's none beside me in God Can we just give him praise for being the great I am? All the glory and honor is his. As one voice, let's sing. The mountains shake before him, the demons run and flee. And at the mention of the name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who. Come on, church, we sing. Before the power and the presence of the great.
great I am. You may be seated. Let's stand together and recognize by our standing that we can only stand, live, and move, and have our being in the power and the love and the strength of our Lord today. And I pray that no matter where you are in life, that you can offer these truths together that impact your heart. Come on, sing this day. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Come on, church. He is my light, my strength, and my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, is firm through the fiercest drought and storm. And what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand in Christ alone, who took on flesh for the fullness of God in heaven. This gift of love and righteousness was scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. It's one thing to, to know it in our minds, another thing to remind our hearts of this truth, that he conquered death and that he lives forever. There in the ground his body lay. Come on, church. Light of the world I die. And he lives today. And then bursting forth in glory. grateful for the name of our Lord 
God's name represents who he is and what he's done. Transcends anything else. Let's sing this together. Come on.
Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Glad that uh, we can gather today to worship our risen Lord Jesus Christ. I want to uh, echo some of the announcements that Ben made just to let you know if this is our last First Connections for a couple of months. We're going to uh, take a break in June and July. So uh, if you want to get into First Connections before uh, I guess the next school year starts, this is it. So look forward to seeing you after our uh, third service today. Love to, love to see you there. Also, uh, we have a couple of our guys, uh, Jerry Bolander and Ralph Ledgerwood. They left early this morning to head to Houston uh, with disaster relief, with the flooding there. Also, some of the Arkansas disaster relief chainsaw crews are headed to Oklahoma. And so we want to be in prayer for that. There's a lot of ministry that takes place. And every time that happens, people get saved. Uh, God uses that to save the lost. And it's a great ministry that we get to be a part of as Arkansas Baptists and Southern Baptists. And so we're very grateful to the Lord for uh, our participation. And also echo uh, Ben's announcement and our missions focus for Steve as um, there'll be three of us, uh, I think four of us, uh, joining him uh, around May 18th, I guess, and so he's going to be there a little bit longer than us, but uh, uh, I'll be out a, a little bit, uh, but I'll be here next Sunday as we launch uh, a We Are Family, as we talk about uh, the family on Mother's Day, and uh, we should have a lot of folks here, usually do on Mother's Day, so let's pray that God would use that uh, service uh, really to, to advance his kingdom, people will be saved. So we want to go to the Lord in prayer, have a time of prayer, continue our worship. If any of you want to join me in the altar, I invite you to come as we pray together. I ask the Lord to bless this time that we share together. Father, we uh, do want to give you all praise uh, because all, pl- all praise belongs to you. Uh, and we exalt you and worship you today. God, we come uh, asking for your help uh, based on your your word, you tell us to do that. We read in your word how you provide for us. You're a strong tower we run to, a very very present help in time of trouble. You, you cover us under the shadow of your wings. Uh, you are a refuge to us. And we thank you for that. Lord, we certainly need all of that. And we ask that we would be very much aware of your presence today. And we ask, Lord, that you would heal our bodies. We pray that your hand would be upon us Uh, God, that you would lift us up out of our our discouragement, and Lord, that you would give us joy uh, in our journey today. Lord, we do pray for Steve and the work there in South Asia. We ask, Lord, that that the gospel will spread as uh, as this training takes place. Thank you for the opportunity we have to uh, be involved in this, and, and Lord, just how you are growing our effectiveness in, in ministry in this area especially. So we look forward to seeing the impact of all that takes place there in South Asia. And Lord, we do pray you'd continue to raise up people uh, from among us to go to the mission fields of the world. And, and Lord, that uh, you would uh, make us ascending church in every way. And uh, Lord, we I pray today for the preacher that you would help him as he preaches and Lord that you would uh, give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say, that you would transform us, that you would help us Lord uh, to follow Jesus today and it's in Jesus name I pray, amen. Well if you've got your Bible go ahead and open it to the Gospel of John chapter 21 and we'll be looking at verses 18 through 25, this will be our last message, 57th message Uh, In the Gospel of John, a year and four months or so, we've been journeying through the Gospel of John. And so, uh, you didn't think we'd ever get to the end. Well, we we made it uh, today, and uh, we'll pick up where we left off last week, and where it is the epilogue, chapter 21, is the epilogue, chapter 20, there at the end of it. We, We find the very purpose behind the book, and then... We see Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection from the dead, and last week we were reminded of the primary motivation for ministry leadership and also the primary expectation of ministry leadership, and and that is, first of all, to love Jesus. That is the primary expectation. Three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And that's the question that we need to ask ourselves each and every day, and especially those of us who 
provide some kind of ministry leadership along the way is that do you love Jesus? Do you, do you love him? Well, that's the most important thing. And then if you do love him, uh, we are to uh, sh- shepherd his sheep. We are to feed the sheep and tend the flocks and tend the lambs. And, and that means to lead them, to feed them, and to protect them. And that was what uh, Jesus was calling Peter to do. And we pick up today from that conversation, which uh, continued, and as he talks to Peter, two times in this section of Scripture, Jesus tells Peter, follow me. And so we're going to frame our discussion today uh, along the lines of following Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And very specifically in this text, what is going on that constitutes following Jesus? And so We're going to begin reading in verse 18. If you have your Bible and you're physically able to stand, I invite you to stand with me in honor of reading God's Word today. Beginning in verse 18, the Bible says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said it, said to Jesus, Lord, and what Lord, and what about this man? And Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore this saying went out among the brethren that our disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is a disciple who is testifying to these things And wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Father, thank you for the testimony of John in this passage that that this is true. And Lord, we thank you that your word also tells us that you will use it to accomplish your purpose and especially in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Uh, As I've already mentioned two times in these closing words, we see Peter being instructed to follow Jesus. That instruction is a continuous action. In essence, he's saying, keep on following me. It's a command for Peter. So Peter is commanded to shepherd the sheep in the previous verses, and here he's commanded to follow after Jesus. And to follow someone means that you can't be ahead of them or you're not following. It also means that you can't be too far behind or you can't follow them. I don't know if you've ever had someone will just follow me uh, in, in, in your car, and then they take off, and they ran off and left you, and you didn't, you didn't know where they turned or, or if they went straight or went right or left or anything like that. So in order to follow someone, you have to be close enough to them that you can follow them. They've gotta, there's got to be a close proximity to that. And so Jesus was telling his disciples, follow me. And, and in order to, to follow him also implies that there is movement Uh, Following someone means that that person's moving, so you've got to be moving. You don't follow something that's sitting still. They don't say, well, you you just go stand beside it or whatever, stand beside them. But Jesus is on the move. Jesus is actively doing ministry, and Jesus is on the move today, and he's he's reaching the nations, and he's moving in the lives of people, and, and Jesus is calling us to follow him to be uh, after the things he's after. To, and the way that we stay in close proximity to Jesus so we can follow him is through God's word and prayer. 
It's through the word of God in prayer that, that we, we know what Jesus is doing. We, we know what Jesus is about and we stay in communion and fellowship with him. And in other words, he's, he's within eyesight. We can, we're, we're close enough that we can follow him. And so today we want to challenge ourselves on following Christ. And that's the, that, that's the common way that Jesus called his disciples, and we see that in all the Gospels, and we see it in this one. In chapter 1, it says that John the Baptist's disciples, two of his disciples, heard Jesus and followed him. And then it tells us that Andrew, the, the brother of Simon Peter, that, that he followed Jesus. And then it also tells us there in chapter 1 that Jesus spoke to Philip and told him, follow me. So our message centers in that idea of following Jesus. And so the first thing I want us to consider today is that to follow Jesus by trusting him in death. Trusting him in death. And it has been said that you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. And certainly following Jesus helps us be prepared for death. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's very interesting in verse 18... What Jesus said, he uses that truly, truly, amen and amen in the original language. And he, he, he says, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, if you, you just stop there and we didn't have the explanation of chapter of verse 19, you'd think, well, my goodness, this is when my kids put me in the nursing home. Uh, this is when, uh, you know, I used to gird myself and now I can't do it anymore, so I'll raise up my hands and, and people take me where I don't want to go. That's when they take the, the car keys away from you. Uh, you don't know why, just because you've had 12 wrecks in 12 months, but uh, uh, but th they do that. And, and so that, that's what you think, that's what comes to mind, but there's clarification. Look at verse 19. It says, now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And so Jesus clarifies in verse 19 that Peter would die a death in the same way that Jesus did in, re in spreading out his hands, that he would be crucified in death is what he's talking about. And, and Peter embraced that. Uh, we see that in particular in the writing of Peter in First and Second Peter. First Peter chapter four verses fourteen through sixteen. We're not going to take time to turn there and read it, but in essence, what Peter is saying is that if you suffer for Christ's sake, you should rejoice. If you suffer for Christ's sake, that it glorifies God. And so Peter embraced a, a biblical suffering, a suffering that was associated with serving and living and following Christ, that that kind of suffering could actually be rejoicing. And it is the idea that we can actually have a degree of joy and rejoicing even at death. And, and it's what Jesus did is that, he faced the cross. The book of Hebrews says that, that, that he saw the cross and that uh, in, in anticipating that, but before the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. And that, that it wasn't that the cross wasn't hard and the cross wasn't difficult and the cross wasn't painful and it wasn't agonizing, but for the joy that was set before him beyond the cross, the resurrection, and the fact that all who would believe in him would be saved. In the same way that we don't necessarily look forward to death, and death is described as uh, agonizing, it's painful, it is the, the curse of sin is death. And everything that we know about death is, as a human is, is not good. You know, we, it's sadness and Usually there's pain and all those kinds of things that are associated with it. But what we do know, we know that death is imminent. That death is common ground for all of us. We come from different backgrounds, we're different ages and all that. But one thing we all have in common is that we're all going to die. And, you know, some of you have never been to a funeral. Some of you maybe go to one every once in a while, once a year or something. But... Around here, we have funerals quite frequently, quite regularly. Uh, we have funerals, and 
Because it is appointed a man once to die, then the judgment. And so everyone keeps that appointment. No one is ever late for that appointment. And because of the imminence of death, then people think about it. And as they think about it, they worry about it. And they think about the sorrow. And, and many people will describe death as a tragedy, the tragedy of someone's death. But those who follow Jesus, and by following Jesus, it helps to clarify some of the unknown and some of the, the pain and anguish associated with death. That we know that as followers of Jesus, that when we die, we are immediately in the presence of the Lord. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. We, we, we know that we don't go into a, a grave in a comatose state for you know, until the resurrection happens, but immediately we're in the very presence of the Lord. And there's comfort in knowing that. Jesus calls this place paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. The Bible refers to this place often as heaven. And heaven is described as a place that has no sorrow. You know, how, how would you like to be in, a, in, a, in a, a state of no sorrow? You know, we have those moments, don't we? It may be a day, it it may just be a, an hour, but man, it's pretty nice when you go through that hour or that moment and you don't have any sorrow. Well, in heaven, there is no sorrow. There's no pain in heaven. I know that some of you here are in great pain. Some of you are in physical pain, like all the time, and, and I, I'm very much aware that physical pain can be extremely de debilitating and all, but in heaven, there is no pain. There's no tears in heaven, and there's no death in heaven. And so as we think about heaven, we know about heaven, then that should say, man, that's, that's the place where I want to be. You know, we want to be in that place. That place is not like this place. And I assure you, heaven is a real place. Heaven is not a state of mind. Heaven is a real, actual place that those who follow Jesus will live with him forever and ever. So, so heaven helps you to face death. And knowing and following Jesus helps you, and it keeps death in its rightful place. The Bible even asked the rhetorical question Paul did, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The Bible promises in Romans chapter 8 that nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, neither death, which is included in the list. So it can't separate us. The psalmist said that precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. So it is a precious thing. It's a painful thing for us, the death of his saints, but it's a precious thing to God when, when God ushers in to his presence, very presence, those who follow him. And the Bible tells us one of the very most familiar uh, psalms that we, uh, we have that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And it goes on from there. And so we, as believers and followers of Jesus, it helps us to face death. It helps us to walk through death. And my friend, if you believe what you say you believe as a follower of Jesus, certainly death brings great grief. Jesus wept at the occasion of Lazarus' death. The, the Bible tells us to comfort one another with these words. And, and it, it describes the, the, the pain and the grief that we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. So grief is real. Pain is real. Tears flow. We miss our loved ones. And certainly as we personally approach death, it's something that we may not really be looking that forward to. But in reality, if we can look past the, the moment of death and the event of death and see beyond that, it helps us. And so uh, Jesus told Peter to, to follow me, even to the point of death. And for Peter, it was going to be a martyr's death on the cross. The second thing that I want us to see in following Christ is that we follow Jesus by trusting him to providentially orchestrate the lives of others. And we have Peter with Jesus, and he turns around, and he sees John behind him, and he asks, after 
Jesus has told him, well, Peter, guess what? You're going to die a martyr's death. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> You're going to die a martyr's death. He looks back and says, well, what about this one? <laughs> well, what about him? And, you know, the tone of that and the idea of that, we certainly don't know everything that's going on in, in, uh, in Peter's mind, but we can just imagine that he's thinking, well, my goodness, I'm, you know, I'm going to die a martyr's death, but what about this guy? What's he going to do? I mean, what, what's going to happen with him is, is the question that he's asking. And, and Jesus responds in verse 22. He says, so Jesus said to him, I want, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And as Jesus was answering that question, it could be taken a number of ways. One of the ways is that he could be saying, you know, mind your own business. Uh, it's not any of your business what happens to him. Uh, what difference does it make? Whatever I want to happen will happen. And, and when he gets at the idea that many of us have in we wish we were running the race that somebody else is running. We wish we had the circumstance that somebody else had in their life. We wish, you know, that, you know, that maybe our marriage was like their marriage or our job was like their job or maybe we were in, you know, were able to teach a life group like they were able to teach life or, or whatever it might. We might have the opportunities. We might have circumstances and situations because by nature, we are very covetous people. Uh, we're very jealous people. Uh, I heard a preacher say, you know, in all my years of ministry, I've never heard somebody walk down the aisle and confess the sin of covetousness. And it's not like that's not like one of the major sins out there. It's, a, it's, it's very common. And by nature, we all fall into that category. We always see people who, who seem to always be winning, and we feel like we're always losing. And, and I want you to know that uh, for out there that there are some people who rarely win, and may, they may not ever win, and as far as humanly speaking goes, as far as the, the measures of the world and all of that. And, and, and a lot of you, a lot of us, you know, we, we don't always win, but we do win sometimes. And so we lose and we win, and so it's tolerable. But as we look around, we need to be aware there's some people, man, they, they ain't had a win a long time. And so as we look around, instead of being covetous, and jealous of someone, we ought to be grateful to God for what we have and it allow us to have empathy for others and care greater for others. So Jesus could be saying, well, what is it to you? Uh, he could be saying, well, don't worry about it. It's none of your business what I've assigned someone else to do. I've assigned you to do this and, uh, and all. Or he, he could be uh, getting at the, the fact that uh, Peter needed to trust God to use John for God's glory and ultimately for Peter's good. And that's the way we look at those around us sometimes. That's why we ought to be pulling for one another and, and praying for one another and uh, expecting the best of one another because we really do need those around us to succeed spiritually if we're going to succeed spiritually because this life that we share together is a team sport. Uh, and and the, the personal pronouns throughout the New Testament are predominantly plural. And uh, God's instructions are for us as a family. That as a family, we are to work together. And so, like any family, when somebody's struggling in the family, it tends to make all of us struggle a little bit, doesn't it? And if somebody's struggling, then somebody better be doing pretty good uh, to help pull out because if you don't do that, you're going to end up in a hole. Uh, and so, so we, we work together. And some people, uh, they, they're, they're lone rangers uh, by nature. And, and I, man, that's tough. That's tough when you're the lone ranger. And it's especially tough spiritually because it's an impossibility for you to grow spiritually as a lone ranger. God's plan for your sanctification and your gro to growth in Christ-likeness is an impossibility apart from community of other believers. Uh, it is in that community that God sharpens us, iron sharpens iron. It's in that community that God is fitting us together and placing us where he wants us to be so that we're working together, that we might be formed and become that mature man that Ephesians talks about. Uh, and so it's important that, that we, that others around us are doing well. 
and that we're pulling for them so that they might fulfill God's plan for them and God might indeed even use them to be a blessing to us. That person that you're praying for to succeed and excel and grow spiritually might be the very person that leads your son or your grandson to faith in Christ. It could be that they would have that kind of influence. And so God's kingdom is about us having the opportunity of working together with other believers for the sake of God's kingdom. And I hesitate, and I, I, and I don't, I try not to ever say that God needs us, because God does not need us. Uh, you know, we say, well, God needs that guy to go do that, so he can, God doesn't need that guy. God doesn't need anything, because he's God. And, and the idea, I mean, I've heard people that wrote stuff, it's like, it's crazy stuff, like, well, you know, God was lonely, so he created people. That's ridiculous. I mean, God's God. He's not lonely. God is, he is sufficient in and of himself. He doesn't need us. We need him. He didn't create us because he needed, I mean, he needs a headache. I mean, you know, I mean, he really needs us. I mean, my goodness. No, God is. His ways are beyond our ways. He has infinite wisdom, and he has chosen to pour out his grace and his love on us as, as objects of his love, but he doesn't need us. We need him, and, and God's plan is that, that together we would bring glory to his name. And so uh, as, as Jesus says, well, what is it to you whether he lives you know, until I come back or not. What, you know, what is that to you? And, and so we don't need to be so consumed with others that we don't run our own race. <laughs> that, that we're so worried about what they're doing uh, that we're not running our own race. And that's what we can be guilty of. It can be guilty of that in areas of sin in our life. That we're, we're really good at confessing. And I've kind of joked around, you know, we're really good at confessing other people's sin. And we're not nearly as good at confessing our own sin. And, but we need to run the race. And that doesn't mean that we, we're not aware of those around us. Because we do. We share the ministry. We care for those around us. But that we don't get caught up in jealousy and envy of wanting what others have. And, and, and those of us who've experienced the, the grace and the blessing of God, we need to be aware of all of our tendencies and so we don't need to be bragging, strutting, sitting down even. I mean, you know, we need to be sensitive about that. And, uh, and we need to be humble before the Lord uh, in, in all of that. And so I'm kind of chasing a little bit of rabbit. But anyway, uh, a, a third thing that could be there is that we should not also compete for importance in the kingdom. And uh, that's probably more for us preacher types than anyone else uh, that uh, we don't uh, compete. Now, I think a, a level of competition in in eight, just uh, not again, not for importance, but is is healthy for some, because my observation has been most of the people that work hard and all have a degree of some degree of competitiveness at some point or some level in it, and in. in you know, they get up out of bed, you know, they, they, got, they got a reason to do something. And so just, uh, uh, so anyway, we follow God by trusting God to providentially orchestrate the lives of other people. Third thing is we follow Jesus by trusting his word, by trusting his word. And in verse 24, John says, this is the disciple, he's talking about himself. This is the disciple who, te who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And so John is testifying that what he wrote down is true. Now he's writing down scripture, so he's testifying that God's word is true. And that's why we, uh, we greatly value the word of God. John, he was an apostle. He was an eyewitness of the resurrection, of the resurrected Christ. He was designated and appointed by the Spirit of God to write down as a human instrument the Word of God, this Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also the book of the Revelation. So God used him. That was his lane. That was his purpose, where Peter was to shepherd the sheep and feed the sheep. 
and to die a martyr's death on the cross, John had a very long ministry. He was, you know, 90 AD, 60 years or so beyond the resurrection that, that John ministered. And, and it was not an easy ministry. It was a very difficult ministry. He ended up on the Isle of Patmos uh, in, uh, as he was uh, exiled there. But, but he had a difficult ministry, but a long ministry. And part of that ministry was so that he would write down in, in the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and, and the book of the Revelation, the Word of God. That was the lane that he ran in. And he's giving testimony to the importance of God's Word. And we know that God's Word is so important. And so we trust in God's Word. We, we follow Jesus by trusting in His Word. And I, I would submit to you that it is an impossibility for you to follow Jesus and not trust His Word. It's an impossibility and a contradiction of the Word of God to say, well, I just follow Jesus, I just don't believe the Bible. That, that just, that's contradictory. That those two cannot be, both be true. If you follow Jesus, then you will trust in the Word of God because everything that you know about Jesus is found in the Word of God. And it is the, the way that you stay close to Jesus is through prayer and the Word of God that, that you can follow Jesus, that you can hear the voice of Jesus. When I say that, the voice of Jesus is primarily heard through the Word of God. But when God leads you, you he will not lead you but in, a, in a still small voice when you're neglecting the written, clear word of God that he's provided for us. And so we must trust the word of God. And uh, in our 11 o'clock service, we're going to recognize the graduating seniors uh, for this year, the, those who are graduating from high school. And we're in a season, people are graduating from college and high school and, and all. And I just want to uh, speak a word of encouragement of trusting the Word of God. <laughs> As you go off to a different uh, segment of your life, a different uh, season, that do not neglect the Word of God. And we hear about people, they you know, leave, leave uh, high school and they leave the church and they leave Christ. And, and, and that is a sad thing. And, and you shouldn't do that. You, you don't have to do that. You don't have to <clears throat> quote, deconstruct your faith and all of these kinds of things that are, that are supposedly going on. And, and really, those things have always gone on. Satan is always attacking. But I just want to affirm that to follow Jesus, you must trust in his word. And, and that means that you believe God's word is infallible, that, there, that it's true. You believe that God's word is inerrant, that it doesn't have mistakes in it, <laughs> that, it, that, that, it's, that it's true in every, everything it addresses. And you believe in the inspiration of Scripture, that it is God-breathed, that, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, moved on these people who wrote God's word. And in the original autographs, it, it is the, the word of God. And we, it is not like any other word. And so we believe that. That's so important. But also... It's important that you believe in the original intent as far as God's Word. And, and what I mean, the meaning in its original intent. Because we've got people now who are saying, well, yeah, it's true, it's inspired, it's infallible. But, you know, it just doesn't mean the same thing that it did way back then. Now, let's get this straight. What it meant then is what it means. What it meant then is what it means. It, it doesn't change what it means. Now, application of it may change. You know, I didn't have airplanes and cars, you know, back then. So, I mean, you know, and, 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 and so some of the stuff around us is a little bit different. But what it meant back then is what it means. And so this is really important in, in several areas. I don't have time to address all of them. But, but one of those areas is biblical creation, that Biblical creation is addressed in Scripture. And if you can believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis, then the rest of the Bible is going to be easy. As a matter of fact, if you can believe uh, Genesis 1-1, the rest of the, the Bible will be easy for you to believe. But believing in a biblical creation... Because what you'll be, if you go into the science field, you know, they'll say, well, there's no way that you could believe in biblical creation. And, 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 and listen, nobody was there when it was created, okay? 
There wasn't one eyewitness. <laughs> Nobody was there. Oh, there was an eyewitness, and his name is God. And God's word tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he goes down and tells us what he did each of those first six days. So I believe that you, I, I believe a, a, a base is believing in a six-day creation. And, and, that, and, 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 and I believe that. And I mean, I'm, I'm an educated person. <laughs> uh, I'm capable of reading scientific uh, stuff and understanding it to some degrees and all of those kinds of things. I got an engineering degree, all that kind of stuff. Listen, you can be an educated person and believe in a six-day creation. It's not that you're a nut. It's not that you don't, you're uneducated or anything like that. My friend, I'm telling you, it takes a greater leap of faith to believe in an evolutionary theory or a big bang theory than it does to believe in biblical creation. It, I mean, what kind of faith does it take to believe in something like that where there's really not any kind of evidence really out there for any of that? Anyway, I don't want to go to seed on that. But another thing is biblical salvation. Biblical salvation. And biblical salvation is through Jesus Christ alone by grace through faith. And, and, and you'll be challenged as you expand and you know more people and people that grew up in different parts of the world and uh, different parts of the world are coming to our area. And, and, and it's understandable. It's humanly logical for you to wonder and question. And wondering and question is not the problem. It's, it's where do you settle and what do you believe? But if you believe the Bible is true, the Bible is clear that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's, there's not another way. So there's the exclusivity of Christ, but there's the inclusivity of Christ for everyone who believes that if you'll believe, then, then you can come to, that you can go to heaven, you can, uh, you can live with Christ forever, you can be saved, your sins can be forgiven. But it's only through Christ. There's not another way. You can't earn your way. It's not works. And so it's important that we embrace that. There are many others. I, I believe biblical complementarianism also falls in that. I don't have time to get into that in the home and in the church. But the fourth thing is that follow Jesus by exalting his greatness. Follow Jesus by exalting his greatness. This is the last verse of, the, of this uh, gospel. And there, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Listen, we talk about great stuff. We like great, great athletes. We like great musicians, great singers. We like those who are great in the arts and academics, long list of all of this. We, we get excited. We marvel at that and all. But I'm telling you, there's nothing greater than Jesus. There's no one greater than Jesus. Jesus is greater than the greatest of anything and everything. Jesus is the greatest. And we need to know that. We follow him by recognizing here John is at the end of his life writing this. He's been through so much pain and all. He's seen so much go on. And at the very end, he's saying, man, there's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus. And, and that's the way it is when we walk with Christ. We follow him. Then it becomes sweeter and sweeter. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. And that's, that's what it means to follow Jesus, that you are, you're aware of that. And there's no one greater than Jesus, that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let's follow Jesus even to and through death. Let's follow Jesus with, with the people around us trusting God to work in their lives to accomplish his purposes in them and it probably will even bless and benefit us along the way. Let's trust, let's follow Jesus by trusting in his word and by exalting him. Would you bow your head with me in prayer?